Hello and welcome again to the ID Book Club. We're so happy to have you here and uh, we are continuing on in our reading. We have to start with a big if though, um, a very big if, because if training is the solution, well, now we can proceed forward. And that's a big if, don't forget that part. Um, but it's time to plan. It's time to put things together. We've been spending week after week talking about um, the ideas that go behind the action mapping process as we're taking a look, of course, at um, chapters seven and eight of Map It by Kathy Moore. But looking at the action mapping process, we spent a lot of time in that kickoff meeting, really making sure we have that performance problem at the center of our map and branching outward, determining what some of those actions are that stem from that. We can do something with it. And now it's time to plan. Time to plan practice activities. And so as we look into chapter seven and eight, um, you know, we finished this analysis section of the meeting. Um, now it's time to plan. But going back to that big if with the training and, and the um, if if a course tends to be the solution, we're still not out of the woods yet where we can fall into some traps. And, and Kathy makes it pretty uh, apparent to us in these chapters here that now more than ever, more than ever, um, there's a strong temptation to enter a place a place called test land. And as fantastical as that might sound, test land, uh, Kathy says, she describes it as a dim, formless place, devoid of interest. And, and worst of all, has zero uh, solutions to performance problems. Um, or at least if it does, it gets there in a roundabout way. So we want to stay out of test land as we're determining practice activities and tend to lean more into uh, what we might have going on with, you know, actionable, real life, real world type of situations that can help learners solve that performance problem we've been looking for. So as we uh, d dig into chapter seven and eight, there is one suggestion she gives us that um, will help us avoid falling into the pitfalls of test land. Uh, and that is this. Um, we want to consider for now, ignore what the client wants. <laughs> and that, that sounds pretty rebellious, um, but we've said that all along. You know, of course, the the way that we approach clients or SMEs or higher ups when they're coming to us for this uh, ask for coursework or um, some type of training solution, we've said all along. We are the performance consultants. We don't just say yes, we say why. And so she suggests to us, we should probably just ignore what the client wants for now. Um, and she's gonna repeat that over and over again, especially in chapter seven, as we're brainstorming these ideas. And so as we kind of ignore what they want, we'll get there and maybe the course ends up being the solution. That could be the case. Um, but at the end of the day, we wanna make sure we're focusing on practice activities and of course, that brings up the question then of, well, um, what, what is a practice activity? And Kathy gives us a pretty clear definition um, of what that is. And I don't think that's anything foreign to most of us, um, but I think putting some parameters on what those activities are, but also what they aren't, um, is helpful in developing these training and, and performance problem solutions. So... Kathy gives a nice little formula here that, um, you know, if we focused on practice activities as all about recalling information, well, that's not a practice activity. That's like a test question, right? Going away from that school model that we've uh, learned to you know, distance ourselves from, that's all about the test questions, uh, teaching to the test, training for the test, and, and that's about it, not any kind of application. In fact, that's really what a practice activity is, recalling that knowledge but asking us also to apply that knowledge in a, a practical way. Again, I think that's pretty uh, apparent to, to most here if you've had any experience with uh, designing um, training or, or instructional materials. But um, at the end of the day, we have to keep that part in mind. It's not just recalling info, it is the, doing the application as well. And so as we're thinking about that, um, we 
we can focus on applying and coming up with these practice activities um, by doing a couple different things. Um, and one key line that Kathy gives us that I really honed in on and that was helpful for me is understanding this. And it's more than just coming up with a, um, a list of practice activities, brainstorming them, presenting them as, as viable solutions. There's a little bit more of a psychology behind it as well that we need to consider. Um, and that really comes down to this. When it comes to learning solutions or just learning in general, think of how powerful choice and decision-making is. Um, in fact, Kathy gives us um, a, a way to go about this that I think is, is rather helpful. Um, and we've mentioned this here before on, on the, um, in the community, um, how keen we are on showing, not telling. And so Kathy reminds us that good decision-making um, one, allow space for the learner to make those decisions and come to those conclusions themselves. Um, but it also doesn't just tell us, like, no, this is right or no, this is wrong. It shows them through a, you know, multiple methods and uh, variations on those methods um, how, uh, how that might be an incorrect solution or uh, an incorrect behavior being uh, exhibited there. And that means that we're, we're pulling learners in to the information um, when they need to, to pull on that information that they uh, need and require to make a good, clear decision. Well, we're not pushing that information on them. Again, that's like the school model that we're trying to go away from, not so much this action mapping process. So showing, not telling, um, letting them pull the information, really letting them come to their own conclusions on it. But there's really four key criteria Kathy gives us with these activities to have in the back of our mind as we're brainstorming and planning. Um, and that is, again, number one, it starts with a decision. It's all about the action, not about the knowledge. It's all about the action. Making decisions, that decision point, that decision-making process um, is, is rather complex, but that's where that behavioral change comes in. And we can't lose that in developing these activities. In terms of context, we have to be specific to the, the context of the job itself, the context of the setting. Um, when we're practicing that, these activities, we want to make them as real as possible. So being as specific as possible will also help as well. We'll talk about some of those types in a second that she brings up. And that goes along with that realism, right? Make sure that whatever scenario that might be, simulation that might be in these activities, um, it is the same as the learner's job. The closer we can get it, to the, the reality, the more likely it is that performance problem will be solved and you know, we'll, we'll see those results uh, on the job uh, as, as well. Um, but lastly, out of these four criteria required for a solid decision-driven activity um, is consequences. <laughs> and as much as we don't like consequences, um, we understand that they are the best teachers. They, that's the best kind of feedback we can receive. Again, that goes back to showing, not telling, right? If we can show the consequences of what would happen if you make a decision that might not be aligned uh, with the business goal and or the performance you know, objective, then that consequence will stick with us uh, a lot more a lot longer and a lot more effectively than uh, just saying, no, that's incorrect. And so not telling, but showing and showing through consequence, that best kind of feedback. And as we're planning these activities, as we're considering how we might go about that, the, the biggest thing, the most helpful thing of all for me and Kathy's writing here um, was what she mentioned um, to help keep in mind why we're planning these out to begin with. Um, and that is practice activities show our respect for people. We're giving them challenges they care about and letting them draw their conclusions on their own, which I think that's just so powerful. Again, giving that space, giving that opportunity for letting them draw on their conclusions, because what this comes back to is getting away from the school model, treating adults like adults, treating them like people, showing them that respect and letting them learn. Um, and having that space to learn. And that's where you're going to have um, better results and um, solving those performance problems when you give them challenges they care about and make them realistic as well as specific to the context. Um, but most importantly, letting them learn from those consequences um, in a safe space to you know, make those uh, learning changes. So from there though, as we're thinking about 
activities. There's several different types, and I want to hear from you all here in a second as we give our thought questions, um, what your thoughts are with these different activity types. Um, but you'll you'll notice some you may tend to uh, lean into a little bit more with your own training design. Um, others, maybe you haven't uh, experimented with, but this is kind of the breakdown she gives us in considering these activity types. And I thought it was helpful by no means an exhaustive list, um, but these definitely play into the action mapping process. Uh, and that would be things like scenarios, right? We're pretty big on scenario based learning here um, in the ID community. And um, we've seen probably several examples of that. We can break that down into a couple of different types of scenarios, which Kathy does. Sometimes it might be more of like a mini scenario. Uh, a lot of the examples she gave were more like word problems that you might expect to see, you know, I'm not trying to go back to that school model, but um, giving context, giving a scenario, giving a situation and asking a question based on that. Not giving a test question, but giving context and a scenario and a story behind it because one, that's more interesting. Two, it's gonna be more effective, especially if it relates to on the job learning. Branching scenarios are also a helpful way of going about presenting these, especially as we're focusing on decision-driven learning. Because the more decisions and choices you have to make, uh, the more opportunities for either success or, you know, feedback through consequences there are. Um, and so, yeah, that doesn't go into uh, too much detail with all of these, but um, I do suggest, again, I'm not going to go through the examples. Um, if you haven't read already, go through them. She gives a just a wealth of uh, real life applicable training situations where these scenarios, both mini and branching scenarios would be helpful uh, to consider. But then there's the simulation side of things. And there's gonna be a little bit of overlap between scenarios and simulation, but simulation again, may be more task oriented and simulating that task as close and specifically as we can to the actual real job on the job performance problem that we're experiencing. Um, and letting learners have a safe place to kind of play around with that and, and get that feedback through consequences if that task doesn't um, accomplish that goal that they were intending to. Some of that might be through conversation. Notice how, again, these are all very active. They aren't test questions. Um, simulating conversations between individuals, again, a good way of practicing like soft skills if that's the training need to be required. Um, same thing with role play and having uh, learners take on that role. And then there's software simulation as well. But again, all of these are focused on action and decision making. Um, what is the next uh, step in that sequence that needs to be accomplished? Or actually do it. Don't just tell us what that is. Again, we're going to have an opportunity to show, not tell in these kind of uh, activity types. And then that could be real tasks. Like if, 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 realism is the goal. If it's a, you're, we're able to, then let's do a real task on the job as part of that you know, solution um, if, if that hasn't been done before yet. Um, or it, it, at the best uh, case scenario after that is like in a classroom type of environment. Remember, these are not all just like e-learning situations. Um, some of this could be done in other formats, again, depending on the organization. Um, and that's the goal is activities, practice activities can be seen in all these different forms, but we really have to understand who, who the learner is and what the context is and and really, that's what Kathy gives us as one little final um, piece of, of help here before we jump into the format of these practice activities. And, and that's the fact that our goal is to help people learn through experience by practicing in a safe in, uh, place, safe environment with optional help that we provide in its most efficient form. That's the goal. That's, that's on the back of our minds as we're brainstorming these activity types because it's, it's for practice. It's, it's not just for a test. It's for real on the job performance, giving optional help, treating them like human beings, treating them like they have autonomy there and come to their own conclusions. Cause that's the best type of learning that can happen. And so as we get closer and closer to going into some of our thought questions, um, I'd love for us to consider let's kind of take a step back and, and remember where we're actually at in this action mapping process. Because at this point, Kathy has laid out for us, you know, those, that nice little visual of the mapping process looks something like this. We have our target, our goal in the center. From there, we've already developed a, a good list of the core crucial actions that need uh, to be done on the job in order for that goal to be met. 
but then within that, we have all those opportunities for that like hands-on kind of practice um, activity that might bring us to that action to bring us to that goal. But in all of these things, Kathy reminds us of one thing, and that is we have to commit to choosing the best format for each activity, not one format for the entire project, right? That, that's, that's the goal there. Um, everything is individualized in that way. There is not a one size fits all. That's kind of the theme of chapter eight as we move on into that. And so considering those things, um, we probably need to decide what works best for each scenario? And she gives us some tips for that. Um, and again, I want to hear what your responses are here in a second with these. I have a related thought question to this on how we might um, approach this. Because as we decide what works best, um, we can't forget to continue to challenge assumptions um, and challenge the influences that that surround us in uh, the the environment that we might be in. And when we say challenge assumptions, it's not just challenging the assumptions of the clients or the, the uh, higher up managers who are requesting some type of training. It's also challenging our own assumptions and influences. Uh, and in fact, one of those assumptions and influences, you know, we want to get away from is like, oh, we've always done it this way. Okay, that might not be what works best. In fact, that might be why we have the performance problem in the first place. Um, sometimes it might be like, hey, we, we've used this tool for a lot of things. We've put a lot of money into it. We want to keep on using it. You got to question that assumption and that's going to be the best thing. But one of the influences that Kathy gets into, which is um, may affect us in you know, the, the school model we're so used to that we have to get away from, we don't want to lean into, we don't want to lean into test land too much. Um, this gets, I don't want to say controversial, but uh, there's definitely been some debate about it, um, ignoring myths. And really the myth she focuses on is that learning styles myth. Um, and I know from my experience as a, a K through 12 teacher, it's, it's pushed like a lot. Um, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of research that, that backs it up. Um, Kathy gives us some good uh, resources there for you to consider if you're looking there on page 192 or 193 um, that talks about this. But we really should probably be applying techniques in our training activities that research shows actually work. And it's not really this learning style, this like visual audio kinesthetic style or variation that gets pushed sometimes. Um, but we could still consider learning preferences, like knowing our audience is going to be helpful and that might be helping us decide what works best. Um, but I'm excited to hear what you have to say about that one uh, in a little bit when we discuss, but we wanna consider culture, we wanna consider context. All of those pieces matter. It's not a one size fits all. That's probably why we're in this problem to begin with. And give the learners control. Again, going back to that quote we said earlier, treat them like humans, respect them as people because People need to have autonomous choices and, and they learn best when given that space to come to their own conclusions. Um, and focus on when, because when should training take place? When, when should these practice activities actually occur? Think for a second, like what, what would your answer be to that, that question? When should they occur? Because Really, the answer is it depends, right? But we have to deliver the activity at the point of need. Where is that point of need? And so that's part of this determining on what formats it's going to be used in is when is it needed? It might be before an actual task is done. It might be after an actual task is done. Um, but the most important thing is we need to space that learning. Uh, we've referenced spaced learning from the very beginning of uh, our book club. Uh, and Kathy does a, a pretty good job of reminding us of how important that is. It's not just a one time event, not a one time, one size fits all type of training either. It is space practice over the course of time. That's really going to produce those beneficial results. And again, we have to resist that urge to package activities as an event um, rather than, I don't know, could, could they just be um, spaced in a certain way? Could it be, um, you know, multiple opportunities for, um, you know, learning uh, one one aspect, one action related to that uh, business goal, and then another opportunity way down the line to practice uh, another one of those um, opportunities. So we have to resist that urge to package activities as an event. Um, and beyond that, too, um, I think she kind of puts it well this way on page 211. Let the audience, the task, and the job influence your choice of format. 
not the client, <laughs> not our past experiences with the school model, uh, not our perceived notion of learning styles uh, and things like that that we probably want to avoid. Um, but don't forget the people, right? Don't, don't forget who, who is going through these practice activities and what they need and what the point of need is. And that will make the difference. And I'm excited to hear your specific examples as we uh, move on into that. Um, but just before uh, we go to our focus questions in a, a moment, and we'll jump into those uh, discussion tables, one thing that we might want to consider is this. Um, a quote she gives us as she wraps up this section that I thought was um, pretty helpful to consider. And that is, if no one else in our organization is asking the hard questions about learning models, right? Like this is the way we've been doing it. We've been, this L and D team has been focused on um, applying this type of learning model. Well, we have to do it. We have to question assumptions. We have to question influences. Um, we're the last line of defense. So Kathy's really good about empowering us uh, as learning consultants rather than just order takers. Um, and, but that's hard to do, right? And that's probably why we're in this scenario and situation to begin with is um, quite uh, Things haven't been um, questioned. Assumptions haven't been questioned. And um, it might be because it's hard and we're afraid to do it. Uh, and again, every organization is different and uh, it, it's easier said than done. So that's not to discount anyone's uh, experience or opportunities that they've had. But th at the end of the day, um, we're talking about practice activities. Um, this is a chance to really make a change. And I think uh, we can probably come up with some cool, cool ideas here in a moment. So um, in fact, Let's focus on our uh, thought questions. I have three of them for you. And then we'll jump into those discussion tables as we've always done. We'll discuss for a good while. We'll have some uh, volunteers and nominees uh, hop up on the stage here to share out what their table found. And then we'll kind of wrap it up for the day as we finish up chapters seven and eight. So first thought question uh, of the day we might want to consider is this. What does realism look like in scenario-based activities? Because, you know, fictionalized accounts, um, coming up with uh, character personas, like that's fun and all. I think you've maybe had experience with that. I want to hear about that experience. But what does realism really look like? Because Kathy argues that the more realistic something is, the better um, or more effective or more efficient that, um, that solution will be in solving that performance problem. So realism in scenario-based activities, what does that look like? I'd uh, love to hear your uh, experience there. Number two, where does self-paced e-learning fit into this process? Again, we're all about self-paced e-learning when it's appropriate. Kathy says the same thing, but when it's appropriate. Where does it fit into this action mapping process? Uh, is, is this the best solution? And let's be honest with ourselves, is this kind of our fallback solution? Or is it appropriate? I, I don't know. I want to hear your experiences with that um, and see what your organizations are, are like in terms of uh, what's usually expected there. Uh, and lastly, question number three, one thing for us to consider goes to this controversy. <laughs> I already saw some uh, moments in the chat there uh, where there, there might be some of that present, maybe not so much in your organization, but maybe even from your past prior learning. And that goes back to learning styles and uh, how Kathy essentially calls it just a pseudoscience, right? Uh, that's that's not research backed. Um, although we could love to hear perspectives on all that. But if, if learning styles are to be avoided, should we consider learning preferences instead? Like, how does that play a role within designing these practice activities, brainstorming these practice activities that are, will be helpful for finding those solutions for um, who, whoever the the um, learners are in your scenario and situation. So three questions there. We'll have three discussion tables. I encourage you to hop into uh, one of the three, maybe we jump around a little bit. Um, we'll have some volunteers and nominees ready to share out with us because I'd love to hear what it's all about. Because this is what uh, the book club is all about is discussion and um, leveraging our own experiences of bringing them to the table and uh, be able to share with others so we can come out of this with hopefully some good um, actionable tips um, from both Kathy and uh, the rest of the community as well. So I will uh, pause it for a little bit. We'll go in those discussion tables and I'll see you back here in just a good few minutes. Here we go. As we look at question number one, we are thinking about that idea of uh, what does realism look like in scenario-based activities? Uh, is uh, 
realism attainable? I, I don't know where we all went with this question. I get to stop by this table, but um, to, to what degree do we uh, implement realism? Um, is it contextually based? Is it based on the culture too of the organization? Uh, what were some of our thoughts there? I'd love to hear your um, uh, ideas. And uh, Thomas, uh, you're going to head on up here and, and share that out with us. And we'll hear what that table had to say. Come on up. Hello again. How are you Hi. doing? Good, good, good. Um, so, you know, when I hear that word realism, it triggers my the gaming side of me. You know, like I, I like online games. And one of the um, one of, I guess, the game modes that are popular is this realism mode. And what distinguishes realism from, I guess, a regular game mode are the, the consequences. You know, the, the consequences are perhaps more dire, like you have no respawn or something to that effect. And I think this also, uh, you know, Kathy Moore also alludes to the sense of consequences in, um, you know, designing the activities. For instance, you know, there's uh, uh, mini scenarios versus branching scenarios. So real quick, you know, mini, mini scenarios, they allow you to make a mistake, but you go back to those answer choices, right? Whereas, um, branching scenarios you make a mistake but you go on from those mistakes to other you know, activities you know that have their own consequences so this idea of consequences really um sticks out for me in making a quote unquote like realistic learning activity um and also you know spaced repetition is another um another thing that's sort of uh, uh sort of peppered throughout i guess chapters seven and eight and Kathy Moore also um, gives homage to this other book, Make It Stick, which also talks a lot about the spaced learning, spaced repetition idea. So I think combining the consequences with, you know, spaced uh, activities could really sort of, you know, help in this direction uh, towards, you know, again, quote unquote, uh, a realistic learning activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And yeah, thanks for sharing because like, that was a big, big takeaway. Consequences are feedback, right? Consequences are feedback. And when we look at it that way, we probably don't look at life that way all the time, but it, but it is, right? That That's how things go. When we have to deal with consequences, things we weren't expecting, that's feedback to us. So we might need to change something or change the situation. But um, yeah, at the end of the day, that's something that test questions can't help us arrive at. I mean, what, what's a consequence? You get a bad score, but what, what's a bad score? Um, that, what's, what's that look like in real life? That, that, that doesn't, doesn't happen. And that's Kathy's argument too, right? So yeah, I appreciate you bringing up the consequences piece. And, um, and maybe the goal is, hey, you experience this consequence uh, and you see how that can help you change that behavior. And then when you have that space practice, like you're referring to later down the line, you can actually see almost in um, like real time, depending on how far away that space practice is, the results of that feedback from the consequence, because maybe you're not going to make that mistake again. Um, so I, lo I love it, piecing those two two together to bring a more realistic um, scenario to to our learning. Um, so yeah, th thanks, Thomas. Appreciate it. And yeah, that that idea, consequence is feedback, is is so I think crucial as we're uh, looking at activities and what they bring. Um, and I don't know if there are any other thoughts on that idea of um, realism in um, our learning and, and training activities that we come up with. But again, I, I think that really does encapsulate it pretty pretty well, right? So if that's the case, um, and there are no other thoughts there, again, just raise those hands uh, to bring brought up to the table. We we also want to to think about um, this this idea too. Um, where does self paced e learning fit in this process? Because I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I, I feel like that is the uh, like fallback option, like that is what we do. And then especially with instructional design and e-learning development, they are two different uh, aspects of a role, but really at the same time, they unfortunately sometimes get blended together. And so that might be end of what, what you what you do a lot. Um, but is that always like the answer? Where does that fit into the action mapping process? Um, what were some of our um, ideas with that and how it helps us develop these uh, practice activities? We're going to welcome Laurel up to the stage. Thanks, Laurel, for uh, volunteering. Come on up. One of the challenges I have with this question is um, 
the assumption, I, I guess, to me, it implies that there is an assumption about the kind of learning that we're doing or, or who mm -hmm. we're doing it for. Sure. Um, and often the assumption in uh, learning design is that we're in a corporate environment and we're training employees. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not true for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my experience was in product training. So I had tens of thousands of learners. Self-paced e-learning is the only thing that's going to make sense because people are in different time zones, people mm -hmm. are in different learning levels, mm -hmm. um, people are in different experience levels, mm -hmm. and when um, uh, to try and get, because uh, we did try it, uh, like mm -hmm. webinars together, you get attendance of maybe three. Um, uh, so it's just because, you know, five o'clock doesn't work mm -hmm. for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. There are what, over uh, uh, 2000 people in this slot community and we get mm -hmm. an average of 20 mm -hmm. for the book club. Sure. Um, that's a, a, a small percentage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are different things that we can do to augment the e-learning, mm -hmm. job aids, um, mm -hmm. Um, providing things like drop-in webinars and and or or that sort of live experience, mm -hmm. um, but it can also be discussion uh, mm -hmm. um, groups uh, or yeah. um, um, uh, uh, knowledge uh, uh, wikis and and documentation and all mm -hmm. sorts of other things that can mm -hmm. go with it to supplement that. Mm -hmm. um, but again, a lot of the traditional learning experience design and learning design stuff is very focused on, oh, you're doing leadership training with your employees, which mm -hmm. you have more options when you have control over the, the when you have some level of control over mm -hmm. the group of people who you're training. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. kind of my feeling about it. Well, I think you really spoke well, though, to what Kathy emphasizes, like you, you have to consider all these different aspects, it's not a one size fits all type of training. Like you have to know your learners, you have to know the audience and the, and the culture. And this goes all the way back to the very beginning of the book, right? And so all of that is so important because it's easy when we're looking at an action map and having that meeting and having a conversation and focusing on what those activities are to forget the person, to forget the, the audience, to forget what sometimes even the need is and so yeah i yeah i don't, I don't think we want to Im imply that like uh you know one way is is better than the other because that's not the situation at all it, it is like we have to figure out what the context and the culture is and play into that because that that's going to produce the best results right it is as close as we can get with that <laughs> and even in a perfect world oh, it, it's not a perfect world we're not going to get there um of, of course but I, I really appreciate those suggestions you gave because sometimes we have to think outside of the box but that self-paced uh, element there is helpful for i think a lot of um a lot of organizations um depending on their size and even if they're smaller like it, it just depends right but yeah, appreciate that perspective. It's it's neat hearing, uh, you know, like in action um, examples that you brought up. Appreciate it, Laurel, as always. Okay, well, uh, as we're looking at our last question, um, this was uh, the one that I thought was a little bit more controversial. But um, when I jumped to the tables, it didn't seem to <laughs> seem to be too much of the case. But um, I do want to make sure we're able to talk about this last one before we end, um, because Kathy does spend a good couple pages uh, dispelling the the myth of learning styles. And so um, I don't know what our thoughts were on that. But if if learning styles are to be avoided can we lean in more toward learning preferences and, and how does that play a role? Should we consider that uh, when it comes to um, our designing training, if that's necessary or learning activities, uh, Sarah hop on up here and I'd love to hear your perspective. Hello. Hello. So we talked about how learning preferences may be a consequence of the previous learning environment. Mm -hmm. So if you've been burned perhaps, or, um, we talked about how, like, if you've been to a group fitness class, maybe you tried it and you decided you liked it. Or, like, if you listen to an audiobook versus a book, you know, the author's intonation brought you a better experience, so you preferred it. And then we also talked about um, potentially considering making a more digestible version of the training. 
so that it helps with mm. those learning styles. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, uh, learning styles might imply that things are ingrained within us. And I think that's what we're trying to get mm-hmm. away from. Um, but, you know, um, maybe it is, yeah, environmental. Maybe it is just a consequence. And it, it could go back to that school model, too. You know, if, if especially yeah. that's being pushed, I think I mentioned, like, I, I experienced that. Uh, that's just kind of like an assumption made that learning styles are a our thing, our, our reality. Um, yeah. And so you make a lot of decisions based on that. But if if so many of us are coming out of that, then that's going to take a lot of uh, concerted effort to make, make sure that we yeah, focus more on the preferences. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know if you all had like examples where you saw that fitting in with either personally or in your organization, but um, I, I think that's something we have to consider. That goes back to what Laurel kind of mentioned too, with like the context and the culture of, of learning preferences are going to play into it yeah how much do we play into it i guess is the question uh how much do you cater to uh, an audience i don't think we need to cater to it perhaps but like i think that we need to keep in mind that like people maybe have been burned has our organization Mm -hmm. burned them Mm -hmm. uh maybe keep in mind like if we need to remember that I work with a lot of clinicians. The clinicians like to read. Maybe reading is just something that they're used to, that they enjoy, and maybe that's a better method for them. I think from what I've seen, the groups I've worked with have specific like personalities almost Mm -hmm. sometimes. And so like learning how they work Mm -hmm. will help. Do we have to use it? No, we can train (laughs) them out of it. But I think sometimes if it's something we just need to do like quick and dirty, then yeah, Mm -hmm. let's, Mm -hmm. let's do what they love. But I don't think we need to hold to that. (laughs) Sure. 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 No, and I think that makes sense. And as always, it's none of these uh, answers are one size fits all. It depends on the organization, depends on the people, depends on the culture, and depends on so many other things. <laughs> um, exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for uh, sharing. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have Thomas hop up one more time, and um, we'll uh, wrap up with this uh, question here. Yeah, we, um, our group did touch on this a little bit. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, this brings up an embarrassing past where I was a proponent, actually, of learning styles. And there's a video out there where you know, I'm sort of defending it, but, you know, I've since changed, uh, but I think it also ties in with Kathy Moore's, let's say, um, attitude towards uh, like deliverable styles, in this case, technology, right? She, she uses what twine, um, and Mm -hmm. she's not a proponent of, you know, some of the things that we like, it depends. So I think that Mm -hmm. goes hand in hand with this particular quote that I use from my friend, um, a good friend of mine, Dave McCallan, and he's a, he's a senior instructional designer. He said, technology, uh, should not drive the pedagogy. The pedagogy should drive the technology. And I think mm-hmm. we can apply this to um, learning styles as well. You know, um, I think teachers, they naturally have this sense of, um, let's say, universal design. You know, once they step into the classroom and they get a sense of uh, their audience, let's say, um, they, they progress towards this, oh, they progress away from this uh, learning styles idea. However, I think institutionally it's hammered into them. So they think they believe in this learning style, but they're not actually practicing it. So, you know, a lot of teachers that are sort of discouraged because, you know, they, they, you know, thought they, they held on to this dogma of learning styles. I don't think they really do um, in the grand scheme of things. However, this idea needs to, um, if, if not put away, uh, re-examined. Um, but so that's my take on that. Sure. Yeah. And I think that's a good way to approach it. Re-examine it because uh, the conclusion Kathy comes to is again, like learning preferences definitely are reality. Like people prefer the way they learn, but um, again, to maybe play into something that's like, oh, it's ingrained, it's inculcated in us. Like that, that is what you, how you learn and how you learn best. Um, uh, what, what happens when a, like a visual auditory kinesthetic learning style doesn't actually uh, uh, or maybe even it becomes a barrier to job performance. Well, then now we really have a problem too. So yeah, you're right. Re-examine that, understand the the way it fits into these practice activities. Um, but at the end of the day, um, if we understand the, the learner, we understand their situation, but we also understand the business need and the business goal, then I think we can probably uh, do a little bit of compromise there and come up with a good 
performance solving um, solution. So yeah, thanks again for sharing, Thomas. Appreciate it um, so much. And everybody's responses. I loved hearing those conversations. Um, and uh, we didn't get too controversial with that last one, but uh, it does give us something to reflect on. In fact, talking about uh, further reflecting, uh, let's talk about our uh, next steps and where we're headed from here, because um, we do want to head on over to chapters nine and 10 for next week. Uh, we are already at the halfway point with our reading. Uh, it is going by fairly quickly. I know these last few uh, chapter sections have been fairly dense, but if you're considering um, how we can further that activity design, uh, we want to keep on pushing forward to chapters nine and 10. We want to continue checking out uh, the Slack for any updates there. Uh, Shout out to Laurel for thanks for sharing in the Slack, uh, one of those awesome resources from Kathy. I appreciate that um, as she's updating that. So please, if you have things to share, share it there. We'd love to continue the conversation um, even when we're not going live like we are right now. And then um, we're trying to have that uh, ID community reading hour every Thursday um, around 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. So if you're able to join a uh, casual conversation there, talk through, do some reading together, that would be um, a great opportunity. Otherwise, hey, uh, thank you all so much for being here. And we have a pretty nice, consistent group and I love hearing your insights. Um, and Hey, uh, we will make it through together. So we'll hold each other accountable, get that reading done for chapters uh, nine and 10, and I will see you next week. Have a fantastic day. I will be at those discussion tables. If you like to, uh, chat a little bit more, uh, otherwise I will see you next week. Bye.